This week and for the next few weeks, we're talking about the process of developing the script of 2020 Visions in preparation for the preview run of the premiere production in London in February 2019. For details of the preview run, visit our website, 2020.productions. I'm Maurice Thorogood, and here's the writer, Paddy Gormley. When I first drafted this play in 2000, 2001 mainly, I naively imagined it would go straight onto the stage and be a huge success. I was very soon disabused of any such nonsense when I saw the feedback from the Bridewell Theatre reading, which we reviewed a few weeks ago, Morris, you and I. I hadn't seen that feedback before. But now that we've looked at it together, it's almost as if you had seen it a couple of years ago, because it seems to me that you and I between us have dealt with all the issues that were raised, and a good many more besides. I remember at our very first meeting to discuss the project, you already knew that 80-year-old Alec was going to be on the stage. Yes. And that he would have a professional carer. Yes. It seems to me that everything flowed from there. Well, you're very modest. You've had a much bigger impact than you're letting on. For example, you told me almost immediately that the title would have to be changed. The play was called 2020. What does that mean, you said? That's not a play. And you came back immediately with 2020 vision. And that was the spark for further ideas, such as Alec's half-blindness, of course, his inner vision that conjures up the remembered scenes of his love affairs. And then you told me to sketch out some scenes for Alec, 80 and Roz. And you did it within a matter of a few days, and brilliantly, and the play really started to knit together properly for mm. the for the first time, I think. And we, we've kept the shape of it ever since. No, not quite. We needed to find a new way of opening the play. In the original version, I just plunged into the 1960 story with Alec Twenty and Belinda and left it to the poor old audience to work out who the characters were and to piece it all together as the various stories unfolded. That was certainly not good enough for you. You can't expect to overcome that at AWL. That's Actors and Writers London, the reading group that hosted the reading. The rehearsal period has to be short because everyone is giving their time for free. If you're directing a big play, you should count yourself lucky. If you get all the blocking done and next thing you know you're on, the real work comes afterwards. Ah, but you're one of a handful of lovely directors who are willing to work on the development with the writer in the weeks before the reading. Yes. But for me, that's very, very important, that we understand one another. And it, it works, provided the writer is willing to accept that the script might need developing once it's in the hands of someone who is seeing it quite differently. Mm. The, the director sees it visually and how it knits together. You need debate and conference and development. It is certainly true that the play we saw at AWL was far above the original version. I say we, but of course... You weren't there. On the day of the reading, a tree fell on the Brighton line and there were no <laughs> trains to Victoria. I remember it well. Oh. The frustration. We needed one more hour to, to prepare the whole piece, uh, which we were going to do at AWL in London, mm. and I just could not get to London. So you took over and uh, the cast were with you. The cast was Olivia Buzzblog Busby. Yes, Buzzblog. <laughs> Alexander Jonas, who is known uh, uh, yeah. as Professor Prune on Twitter. Yes. And Leanne Tucker, with Charlotte Jennings playing in the music and sound cues that you and I had devised. We were profoundly depressed when we heard that you couldn't be there. You had put so much work into the development and the rehearsal. We held an early evening conference and decided it would be unfair to present your moves when you weren't there to see them. So, the actors sat in a row and delivered their lines radio style. I've often thought your play would work brilliantly on radio with just a few minor tweaks. So, yeah. in many ways, that sitting in a row was a radio presentation of it. I think the approach worked well for the AWL audience too. Why was Belinda taken away from me? I, I can't live without her. Are you okay, Alec? Did you call me? No, no, Ros. I, I was just thinking out loud. I searched for her daughter, Natasha. It took me 20 years to find her. What's up? Your face. The rain? No, no. You've got an angel's face. Are you all right? I should have told her, but the words wouldn't Stop come. Stop getting pelted by this rain. 
Rescuing attractive damsels in distress is something that I've always dreamt of. The language of your characters is, well, so beautiful. Ooh, people were listening really carefully. That's gratifying in itself. And the feedback was very positive too. I remember how quickly Olivia and Alex found the voices of their characters in rehearsal. And used them so effectively. What would you say we got out of that reading? On the positive side, lots of praise for the verse writing and the quality of dialogue. And for the new characters of Alec 80 and Roz, which we were trying out for the first time. I love the way you use um, verse in your writing because it's very subtly done. Mm. I didn't quite get it at the beginning, but then I started to hear it. And then once you've heard it, you're listening out for it. And, and it sort of just brings the dialogue to, gives it that extra level of interest. So I really enjoyed uh, I thought it was delightful. Mm. Very atmospheric with the music. I was caught up in was the way that you've given in each of their, the characters their character and also the dialogue, which was tremendous because it... I just... thought the carer was brilliant, all of that, and I don't know if anyone's read Dirk Bogard's uh, biography. The, the last month he had a carer and he didn't see anyone for weeks. And the negatives? <laughs> one, one person managed to come to the conclusion that Natasha was Alex's daughter and that Lucy was the incestuous <laughs> love child of an incestuous well, uh, love child. Everyone has an opinion about a play. Um, anybody, dialogue, yes. anybody looking at the script would realise there was no possibility of incest, but I knew immediately that I had to make it a lot clearer. And Paul Anthony Barber made a very good point about the lack of tension in the early scenes. So we've got one, one more comment. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I thought it was absolutely hauntingly, hauntingly beautiful and um, very effective, which is no help to you at all. Um, <laughs> so one criticism I had, I think, but I felt just something in the pacing. It was reflective almost throughout. And if there could have been a change of for the first half of the first act, if there was a slightly more dynamic, even though the words are dynamic, but there was a feeling of a la recherche de Pompidou throughout. And I think if it could have, if that could have crept in and then moved through to the ending, I would have found it more theatrical. But your dialogue is, is distressing me. I've never liked you, Barry, but... That's <laughs> 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 beautiful. Thank you, Daddy. That was so useful. It prompted me to put in some voiceovers, bringing forward unsettling lines from later in the play so that the tension started crackling in the opening scenes. We've done a fair bit of work on that front since then, but it was a very good start. Paddy Gormley and I have been talking about the 2016 reading of 2020 Visions that was such a significant step in bringing this wonderful play to the stage. Next time we'll be talking about the origin of the love letters you heard when we were introducing the characters in the second, third and fourth programmes of this series. The love letters are such an integral part of the play now that it's hard to imagine 2020 Visions without them. But they were not written until 2016 a few months after the AWL reading.